Hey guys, Mr. Hedrick here with one more video on Unit 2 where we've been talking about polynomials, um, what they are, features of them, different operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division with them. And today we're going to transition into a uh, new topic, two topics rather, on uh, functions. So how to compose functions and how to find inverses of functions. And at the end of the video we'll see how are these concepts related. So first subject that we're going to talk about is composition. And that's the idea that you can substitute one function into another. So in the past, in Algebra 1, you've plugged numbers into equations or numbers into variables. What composition refers to is the idea that we can plug uh, variable expressions into other uh, variables and the expressions that go with them. So for example, <clears throat> if I wanted to compose two functions, let's call them f and g of x. These would be two equations. And this is the notation that composition can appear in. So for example, um, what this really means is I'm going to place g inside of f. Again, I'm going to place g inside of f. So how is that going to look? Well, in this case, if f of x is 4x plus 20 and g of x is x divided by 4 minus 5. To plug g into f means to replace the variable with g. So you might want to draw a box, a little arrow pointing to that variable. Sometimes you have more than one variable and you would replace that box with both variables in f. In this case, f only has one variable. We're only going to have to replace one different thing. So f of g of x would look like 4 parentheses x divided by 4 minus 5 plus 20. You'll notice the box replaced the variable, but 4 did not go away. That positive 20 off to the side did not go away. f itself largely remains the same. It's just that the variable was switched out with g, that whole equation on the right-hand side. And you're going to want to simplify. So for example, that'd be 4 times x over 4, which turns out to be x because 4 divided by 4 cancels out. And 4 times negative 5 is negative 20. And negative 20 plus 20 off to the side will cancel. In other words, this simplified to an x. f of g of x, in this case, f composed with g, uh, simplified to a simple variable x. Now that's going to mean something, and we're going to come back to the uh, equation here, or the uh, problem I should say, at the end of this video to learn what exactly that means about our functions. But that is important. <clears throat> the main thing here that I wanted to emphasize was once again, if I'm composing f of g of x, that just means I'm plugging g into f's variables, as we've done here. One more example of that might look like um, the following where we have a little bit of a difference here. You'll notice that um, in this example, I wanted to find f of g of x. So I'm looking for something that ends with a variable, and indeed I found something that had a variable at the end. And the problem here, you'll see, we're looking for f of g of a specific number, negative 4. What that means is we're going to be substituting numbers twice. So negative 4 is going to go into g, we're going to get an answer, and then g of negative 4 is going to go into f. So how will that look? Well, if I plug negative 4 into g, it's variable, right? This is something that you probably have done back in Algebra 1, plugging negative 4 into your variable here will be a simple um, problem where we have to multiply 3 times negative 4 to get negative 12, and negative 12 minus 8 is negative 20. What we're going to do next, because we found g of negative 4, but remember we're supposed to now substitute that into f's variable. Okay, So we want to take that negative 20, plug it into x here, so that f of g of negative 4 equal negative 2 times negative 20 squared plus 9. Again, 
uh, that negative 20 replaced x. So here you will have to remember PEMDAS, remember parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, add, subtract. We need to do um, something with our parentheses and exponent first. We need to square negative 20. So uh, don't multiply by negative 2 just yet. We will do that shortly. Negative 20 times itself would be positive 400. Remember, a negative times a negative is a positive. We have that positive 9 off to the side. <clears throat> negative 2 times 400 is negative 800. And adding that by 9 will give us our final answer of negative 791. Now, this is a very strange number, but that's what happens when you plug negative 4 into G, as our original uh, question asks, and then that result into F. So you're always basically working in reverse. Negative 4 into G, that result into F, just like we had um, G into F for our other example. That's what composition is all about, substituting one function into another. Now, why might this be useful? Well, think about if you were a builder and you wanted to find the volume of a pyramid that you were building. A pyramid's volume depends on its height, and its height in turn will depend on the sides or the slant of a pyramid, right? The height is straight up and down from the top point of the pyramid all the way to the base. That's going to depend on all of the sides of the pyramid. The longer those sides are, the higher the height will be. The shorter they are, the lower the height will be. And in turn, that's going to affect the volume. So if I was to say, try to find what um, would affect my height, if I raise my height for my side, that's going to raise my height of the pyramid. That in turn is going to raise the height of my volume. So you can imagine a scenario where you could have a function that, you know, you have an equation that refers to the volume, something where you can find the height by the side length. And depending on what that side is, you can plug that number into the height formula, that number into the volume formula, and that's where you can see the dependency that exists between certain functions. So that's just one re uh, real world example of how you might want to try to imagine um, how composition of functions works and uh, what it could be used for. One other topic that I did want to cover today, and we will come back to this one, as I said, towards the end, is looking at and thinking about inverses. So this may or may not be something you saw in Algebra 1. Um, inverses basically refers to the idea of a function that switches inputs with outputs, or the domain with a range. So all functions can take in numbers, right? Uh, if I had a function and I plugged a number in and I got a number back out, you're going to get a coordinate point, x comma y. That's going to refer to something on your graph. What inverses does is to switch the place of x and y coordinates. So imagine that I had a uh, function. And that function, I plugged a number in and got a number back several different times. What the inverse function will look like when you look at its table, the x and y values will switch. This input instead will be the output. This output will instead be the input. For the inverse, that's what you have to think about. x and y's switch or swap. They don't change signs. Notice that negative 2 stayed negative 2, positive 4 stayed positive 4. But all of the coordinates for the graph, for your tables, your inputs and outputs switch. So that is how you'd find the inverse of a table. For a graph, uh, it'll be very similar. Okay? Let's pretend now that I have a graph. And uh, you'll notice that this graph's coordinate points matches our original table. Right? Negative 2, comma, 4. Um, 1 comma 0. Okay, what's the inverse of that going to look like? Well, we have the coordinate points already listed, right? 4 comma negative 2. This will be a coordinate point of our inverse function and its graph. 3 comma negative 1. 
uh, 2 comma 0. This crosses the x-axis here at 2 comma 0. 0 comma 1. And if I roughly sketch this graph, okay. it turns out that this is symmetric about the origin. So there's a relationship here. It's a bit hard to see when it's hand-drawn. If you do go to desmos.com um, backslash graphing and try to plug in those coordinates, you'll see that there's a symmetry that exists when you overlap these graphs. And that symmetry exists diagonally as you cross the origin through quadrant one and quadrant three. But uh, basically, as I mentioned before, just like the tables have x and y coordinates swap, so too do we have the um, <clears throat> graphs x and y coordinates swap as well. So tables, graphs, not too difficult to work with. You just need to know the x and y coordinates switch. One last thing that you'll need to be aware of <clears throat> is how to find the inverse of a function. Okay. So how to find the inverse of a function, I have the steps listed on the board. First of all, let's pretend that we have a function and we want to find its inverse. Um, what we'll need to do, first of all, is to switch f of x to be a y, because we're going to want to, in step two, switch the place of x and y. Again, that's what inverses are all about, swapping x and y. So this would be step one, step two, everything else stays the same for now because in step three, we are gonna to start to change things. We're gonna solve for y. This will be how we find our inverse. And we do that by isolating it. So opposite operations, we can add by six to both sides here. Get x plus six equals uh, y divided by three. Opposite of division is multiplying, so you need to multiply three to both sides, and I would include everything on the left-hand side. Uh, three times x will be three x. Three times six will be 18. So y equals that result. And at the very end, the notation for an inverse is an f, little exponent symbol of negative one of x equals 3x plus 18. This is uh, the inverse of our original problem. So, a um, couple things to note here. Number one, inverses involve swapping x and y, but they also, for functions, involve opposite operations. Notice we started with a subtraction, we ended up with addition. We started with division, we ended up with multiplication. Now. The numbers might be different, so you do need to actually solve this out, right? We started with a uh, negative 6, we ended up with a positive 18. That was due to us adding 6, multiplying by 3. But those operations do show up when you're trying to solve for the inverse, and uh, this is what your inverse notation will look like. What you'll also notice is that if you were to compose these two functions, let's say I plugged this. 3x plus 18 back into my uh, variable up here. What you'll simplify that to be will be x, and that's actually what we saw earlier in our first example where we composed functions. It turns out that in this example, f and g are inverses, and the reason is because when we compose them, and you could have you know, plugged um, this 4x plus 20 into the x here and gotten the same value x at the end. Whenever you compose functions, plug one into another, substitute one into another's variables. Whenever you do that and get a simple variable at the end, that means those functions that you're working with are inverses of one another. And that's the case here as well. If I take 3x plus 18 and uh, plug it back into my variable, that would look like uh, 3x plus 18, all divided by 3, minus 6 off to the side. Okay. And uh, 3 divided by 3 will be x. 18 over 3 will be a positive 6. And positive 6 
minus 6 will cancel out. Notice you will have that simple x at the very end, that simple variable, just like we had earlier, and that proves that f and g are inverses, just like in our example here, f and the inverse of x, of course, are inverses. So, interesting to note, good to know, that's an easy way to double check that um, two functions are inverses. You can actually solve it out like we did. Or if you're given two functions, you should also be able to confirm that they're inverses by composing them. So that ties together composition and inverse. That wraps up unit two. And uh, we're at the halfway point of our semester now. So I hope this video helped as usual. And I'll see you next time.